I'm going to move it over to Father in a second. So I don't want to put it on. And do you want it on? Okay. Okay, thank you all for coming. Uh, we are um, going to, let me first, I'm Alice Judd, and I am an artist. I specialize in sacred art. It's kind of grown over the years and evolved in many different areas. I think I started with illustration of children's books for Father Kirby and uh, gone on to painting, painting different things and then mosaics. So um, I'm, thank you all for coming. And I'm, my um, three week agenda is this, this week, this Monday, we're gonna talk about the artwork that I've done inside the church, which will consist of discussing the rondelles, the murals, the little round murals um, along the walls, 28 of them, and then also the um, paschal candles that I have painted over the years. And next week, we will go into mosaic, and we'll talk about Our Lady of Guadalupe mosaic out there, and then the third week, we will talk about the birds of paradise, the peacocks, on the front of the church up on the, the top of the front of the church. Um, my objective for tonight and for each night, but specifically for tonight, is um, to talk about the artwork that is in the church, um, specifically the rundells and the candles. I wanna talk about the process and about the symbolism and what went into it. Um, is there any way, Darren, to make it so I can see it? I can't see, th it's so tiny. I can't see it. Um. All right, well, I'll just turn around and look at it. <laughs> um, but okay. through the, the discussion, I, I'll, after explaining the different art pieces, I want to talk about my personal growth, spiritual growth, through creating the art and um, the process as well, what God worked on in me during that time. And then I would like to talk about and encourage what can the rundells and the candles and this artwork do for you spiritually? How can it help your growth spiritually and grow closer to God? Um, Just keep that Okay, going. no, no, no. Just go back. Because <laughs> now it's Father's turn. So here we go. Okay. okay. So I asked, I brought in a ringer tonight, and I asked Father, it's okay, I'll just look behind me. Um, I asked Father to come in to talk, give a little history of sacred art and prayer, and um, also I asked him to open this evening in prayer for us. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. And also, good evening to all the people who may be watching us right now. Let's see. There we go. Okay. Uh, we, of course, start out with a little prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came to being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. Father, as you have come into your world in a visible way, the invisible made visible, we thank you for your continued gift to us of the beauty that surrounds us and how that can help to uh, encourage us to pray and give you praise uh, to you and through the glory of your saints. As we celebrate tonight and contemplate the gift of 
of prayer and art together. Help us to always see you in every part of your creation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So I'm just going to give a very brief thing, because you really are here to, uh, to hear Alice tonight. And, uh, but I, w- I just want to give a little background on a little history and such. What you're seeing right now, actually, is a very interesting art. Uh, not many people get to see it. It's in Leon, Spain, not Leon, France. It's Leon, Spain. It's right on the Camino de Santiago. I stumbled on it when I was on the Camino. They call it the Sistine Chapel of Spain. It was a, it was a, it's a, a crypt. And uh, there they have these paintings in the ceiling of it. And it's, the whole place is covered with it. And what's interesting too, it's paintings that were done under Muslim rule. This is um, this, this called the Mozarabic uh, rite of the church. So these are Christians that were living under the Muslim rule in Spain. And so they still were able to do their art and they wanted to have their art. They wanted to have their art for prayer. And so what you're seeing right there on the left is the, um, uh, the, the shepherds and the angel coming to the shepherds. And then, of course, on the right is Christ in majesty, really one of the central pieces of it. But let's go a little bit further back. If we really uh, kind of go back to our roots, right, um, there was uh, creation, right? And then God founded a people. We're going to fast forward a bit, all right? And then uh, we, he, in the people he founded... One of the things that he commanded them was to make this, uh, one of the, this is one thing that he commanded them to make. What is it? The the Ark of the Covenant. Very good. And as you know, I'm fond of using the one they had in Indiana Jones because it just looks pretty cool. Um, But on top of it, um, they did it really well from scripture. But on top of it, what do you see? What do you see on top of it? Two angels. In particular, these are two cherubim, right? And not only that, but... God also commanded, if you read in the book of Exodus, also in chapter 25, he commanded that cherubim also be woven into the curtains of this place, right? And then later on, you even see that the Jews will have out front of the temple, uh, they have uh, this basin of water, and it's being held up by oxen, right? So you have these images and stuff, they're not being worshipped, nobody, nobody even thinks they're being worshipped, and even here, God commanded them to be made. And so what's going on here, right? Right? There's something about the beauty, right, that can lead us into deeper prayer. So this really is part, part of our roots. Now, <clears throat> what's interesting in here, this little, anybody happen to know what the stone is? Happen to know what this is? Anybody at home? Just kidding. <laughs> so what it is, is the um, stone they found at St. Peter's tomb underneath uh, St. Peter's Basilica. And it's, they, they call it the graffiti wall. Right? It's a, it's a wall, really with more plaster. And on the wall are just, just, it's covered with people that have been writing things. And you can see uh, a phrase, ora pro me, which means uh, pray for me, right? And, but it was just completely covered. And one thing they found on it is they had to decipher all of it. They had this image, that image that you see there. Can you, can you see, how, see it close? It's called, the, first of all, it's called the Kiro or Cairo. And uh, so that's the, the X actually is uh, the Greek um, letter chi, the first letter for Christ. And then the little thing that looks like a P is actually an R in Greek. So that's the, so the first two letters symbolizing Christ. But look what they've done to the, the bottom part of it. Can you see that? It's a key. So not a, it's Christ and Peter, right? They've, they've made this symbol... But it's actually, you know, go ahead and, and, and entering into that world of art, right? It's not enough that we go, right? So you have these people coming to pray, and it's just not enough. They wanted to scratch their names into the wall, and not only that, but in an artistic way. They made that little key thing right at the bottom. Uh, very, very interesting. It would continue on from there. These are scenes from the catacombs. Um, this is from the catacombs of um, the Roman catacombs. Uh, somewhere between 300 and 350. Um, This is the woman with the hemorrhage going, you know, if I can only touch the hem of his garment. Uh, This is interesting. This was a a Christian woman who, um, and and she had scenes of her life there. So on the side uh, here on the left, it's her marriage. And uh, then on the right is her, uh, she's given birth to her child. And there, of course, in the middle, what's happening 
she is at prayer. And of course, she's reached the end of her life, and her life has become a prayer. What's interesting, she wanted that to be the central focus, or whoever did this wanted the prayer to be the central focus, and yet it's helping us, you know, understand things. We have this, we have this deep desire to express in prayer. Um, as we keep going, this is another uh, one from the Catacombs of Priscilla. Um, I saw one thing, this was about 200, but here it says about 250 to 300. This is the Good Shepherd, right? So <laughs> they're, they're doing images of Christ, uh, very early, these images are going to go into what you kind of know as icons more, right? And then Western art will develop even further from that. Uh, this is the Annunciation, all right? This is third century, folks, right? In the catacombs. Third century Annunciation, catacombs here, Priscilla. The angel coming to Mary, announcing. Um, now let's fast forward a bit. This is 14, I know we've missed up way ahead, uh, 1411. What's funny is it said it's either 1411 or 1425 to 27. So at some time, <laughs> so, sometime during the, um, uh, the life of Rublev, right? So this is a, a Russian uh, iconographer. And this is where, by this point, prayer and art have become one, right? And so again, this is before that, the, the so-called Enlightenment period. What happens in the Enlightenment period? Uh, we go from doing sacred art and, and some portraiture, but mostly sacred art, uh, to doing like fruit in a bowl and things like that, and, and, and a lot of portraits of uh, you know, regular people and all of that. And sacred art still is being made, but not like it was. But here, because, because when you take prayer out of it, what happens, right? It just, it just becomes a picture of somebody or something. But this is not just a picture of somebody or something. What Rublev did, he went deep into prayer. Where can we see the Most Holy Trinity in the Old Testament? There are actually, you know, foreshadowings of it, right, uh, in the Old Testament. Um, but he took this deep in prayer, and wow, what he came up with is amazing. Does anybody happen to know how many people have heard the story of the Holy Trinity icon? Okay, yeah. I see all the people at home raising. Very good. Yes. <laughs> well, they know. So anyway. So, um, so this goes back to Abraham. This is from the book of Genesis. And Abraham and his wife, Sarah, right? Uh, so remember, Sarah was barren, and Abraham uh, uh, was sure he wasn't going to be a father. And they, they were both old. And the, these three messengers of God, these three angels, came to him. But as they start talking during the thing, sometimes it's one, sometimes he addresses them as one, sometimes he addresses them as three. And, but it is three who come to him. And so this is uh, now is what, he, what Rublev has done, is taken this into the New Testament. So on the, on the right is God the Father, on the left is the Holy Spirit, and the color green, especially in the east, is for the Holy Spirit. And right in the middle is the Son, who became flesh and dwelt among us. And whenever you see an image of Jesus in most icons, he's always dressed like this. But look at the faces. What do you notice about the faces? They're all the same, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. One God, three persons. Not only that, but look at the image of the feet here. All right, so it looks like they're actually at an altar, doesn't it, right? And there you have a chalice on that altar, but the whole image itself is a chalice, and the way into the picture is to go through where their feet are, and it opens up into this chalice-looking thing. So the way into the understanding of the Holy Trinity is through the Eucharist. I mean, so you can, and actually there's, there's more to it, but you can see what... What, and he did this, every stroke of his, of his brush was in prayer. And you can see the fruit of that, can't you, right? When we do art with prayer, beautiful things uh, come out of it. And this has endured. Uh, this is one of the most copied of uh, all icons uh, around. And why? So uh, I've read this passage from uh, St. John's Gospel because what did we hear? The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. The church mentions that because of the incarnation, the taking on of flesh, there is a new economy of images. 
Before, we could not see the invisible God, but God has made himself visible. God actually does have a face. God actually did have, does have hands, right? Jesus, and he was, you know, a person, right? And, um, and so it, everything has changed because of that. So this is actually, I just I want to briefly show, this is one of my own icons. I picked it up my very first trip to the Holy Land long, long, long time ago. And um, it had, been, had decorated at some point a Russian church, and there was uh, something that happened. It made its way into Jerusalem and ended up with it. So that's all <laughs> that it matters. So um, you can see on the outside uh, the, the larger image. And then I did a little detail. Look at the detail right there. What do you notice? Like they're trying to... because. What you see outlined there is not something the characters in the icon are seeing. This is, this is um, God breaking through, right, into our experience. He's breaking through. And so you have Mary there. This is um, the assumption or a dormition of Mary, where she, the falling asleep of Mary. And then what is Jesus doing? He is carrying her soul, right, <laughs> wrapped in swaddling clothes, just as she did with him. Right? And then, of course, then she's united body and soul in the very top uh, above. So, so but what, you, what they've done here, they have this, this um, uh, kind of diamond. If you were to take it all the way out, it's a diamond shaped thing. And that is heaven breaking in. Right? So, heavenly reality is breaking into our world. And this was obviously done with great prayer. It's, this is not meant to be art, uh, art alone, it's meant to be art, but not art alone. And you'll also see there are three uh, bishops that didn't exist at the time, and they can be put into the scene too, right? Because these things are eternal. You can see the bishops with the, um, the special clothes. Oh, oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. I thought you had a broom or something. Before, so. <laughs> these bishops with the, these special clothes here. Uh, so I know one is St. John Chrysostom, one is St. Basil, and I'm not sure who the other guy is. But they're very holy, and they're in heaven, so it doesn't matter, right? <laughs> and... Um, and so, but, but with art, you can do that, right? Because in one sense, we are there. What does the Mass do? The Mass takes us to every moment. We are at the Last Supper. We are at Calvary, especially. And we are already getting a glimpse into heaven. That's why I say, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins. Blessed are those called to the Supper of the Lamb. You are at the Supper of the Lamb. When is that? That's heaven, right? So, thanks. Oh, that's the little detail I was, uh, apparently I did that twice. Anyway, okay. Now, I just wanted to, one last part, um, talk a little bit about our architecture, which is going to lead into what Alice is doing tonight. Um, this is not our church. <laughs> this is a, uh, the, the Pazzi Chapel in Florence. Um, our our uh, design of our church, uh, we began with the Romanesque. Um, that's a very, you know, the, the oldest uh, part of, of Christian architecture, right, that was decorated. Uh, but since the title, Mary, Help of Christians in particular, uh, really came out of the Renaissance era, um, we did some Renaissance touches. So one thing you'll notice is the coloration. You see the coloration kind of looks like ours, right? That was on purpose, all right? So, and um, the idea by them painting that and us painting that, it was to sort of imitate stone, uh, just artistically imitate stone. But you'll notice these, um, I need my thing again there. <laughs> but you'll notice these little little features, right? And what are they called? Wow. All right. <laughs> Very good. And um, here we have it. This is not a church, but it's still a Renaissance work. And what do you see at every little, um, uh, little meeting of the columns? and the arches, right? Roundels again. And then that's another, uh, you can see that very easily there. And um, uh, that's actually a hospital. And um, I didn't put it down here, but it's a hospital in Florence. So uh, all of that just to say that um, you know, we didn't make any of this up. This is meant for prayer, right? So when we had these roundels, we did like they did. We wanted to fill them with something that could help people in prayer. And I really believe uh, that we you know, have, have done that. So, at this point, uh, I want to turn it over to the person you actually came to hear, see, hear and see. <laughs> so, here's Alice, and, and thank God for Alice with her wonderful artwork. <laughs> All right, you want me to put this on?
or just leave it there is fine? It seems to be fine there. Okay, good, so leave it. I'll just try not to knock it. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, that's mine. I don't want my germ. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I'll be watching it over there, too. Okay. Thank you, Father, very much. I'm so happy he was able to give you so much more detail than I could. Um, so tonight, the first thing we're going to talk about are the rundels. And I'll tell you a little bit of the history went into making these. There are 28, and I will not be able to go through each one because it, we do want to get to bed before midnight. <laughs> uh, each of them are very rich in symbolism, and there is so much involved in, in what each one means. So as Father said, um, we wanted to make these rondelles in order to enhance your prayer. We wanted them to uh, pop out at you. We wanted them to grab you and to make you think about especially Mary. So uh, Father came to me in 2014 and said, or first I came to him and said, Father, I want to do some art for the church. And I don't even know if he knew I was an artist at that point. <laughs> and he said, okay, I have an idea. We have these round things. We need to fill them. <laughs> so I remember one night we sat together. There were, I, th I think, uh, you know, Father West was there, but he was, he was a seminarian West at the time, and Priscilla was there. And we sat around the living room coming up with ideas for each rondelle. And um, towards the end, it got very goofy because we were very <laughs> tired and we've been doing it a long time. But the first thing, the, that brainstorming was a lot of fun, but it also um, got us excited. Um, we wanted to uh, honor Mary. We are St. Mary's Help a Christian. So we wanted to honor her. And uh, we first went to the Litany of Laredo to come up with titles of Mary. So that when you look at a title of Mary, you think of that side of Mary, that um, what she represented in that way. And um, so most of them are from the Litany of Laredo, though some of them you couldn't put a picture to, some of the titles. And so we had a few extra um, rondelles, and so those we gave to different um, titles or representations that were dear to us as well for Mary. Um, so in choosing the design, I must say, and I have to, you know I have to mention it, the checkerboard was not my idea. <laughs> I fought it. I actually gave many other options. And no, uh, it was actually, um, I'm sorry, blank. Uh, our architects. James McCurry. James McCurry. Sorry, James. <laughs> uh, his idea, he had seen a mosaic rondelle somewhere, and it had the yellow and black checkerboard. And he wanted all of them to have that, to tie it, them all together, and to pop out. I mean, when you see black and yellow checkerboard, your eye goes up there. And it's to draw our eyes up there. But then with the blue background being all the same, and they all matching each other, it's not um, shocking, it's smooth, because they're all together, all 28 are the together. And as my mother pointed out too, now that all the colors of the church are complete, they all match, and there was a reason for that. We sat down and made sure that the blue background, which is blue because of Mary, it's to honor her, it's Mary in blue, was gonna match the ceiling. The yellows, we wanted to match the behind the altar place that has a special name. Yeah. And, thank you. and the colors tie into the altar itself. And so all of it has meaning. There was no accidents involved. It is all, and then now the beautiful stained glass have the same blues. This is all meant to be, it's, um, and it's all for Mary. We're doing this for Mary. Uh, 
So that's how we chose the designs. We sat down, came up with titles. Uh, and then I sat down and I would sketch out and paint and come up with ideas. The great thing is I could do this at home. These aren't murals that I painted up there. I had thin pieces of wood I could do in my little studio at home with six kids. It would have been hard to uh, be at a studio at that time. So at home I would paint these and father was wonderful in guiding me along. There were a lot of mistakes along the way. Probably. Our favorite mistake is what? The Tower of David. The Tower of David. <laughs> so one of those is um, our, our Lady of the Tower, or the Queen of the Tower? Our Lady. I think it's Our Lady of the Tower of David. And so I went and Googled, what does the Tower of David look like? I don't know. And sure enough, there is a Tower of David still there. It's still there all these years later. So uh, this is great. I already have it. I don't have to make up one. So I did it, I did the little Tower David and did the little cute little moon on top and everything and I showed it to Father and he said, oh Alice, that's great, it looks great, oh, it's wonderful. We're on the right track. <laughs> but, <laughs> the little moon that's so cute to you actually being something, that's when the Muslims took over the Tower of David from the Jews and put their own symbol on top. It might offend some people if we have that on there. <laughs> so I went back to the drawing board and took off the little cute little moon. I thought it was adorable. Uh, another one that I loved was the um, Our, Our Lady of the Rose. And, or is it Queen of the Rose? Half of more Our Ladies, half of them are Queens. Mystical Rose. Mystical Rose. And I, I wanted to find a kind of iconic ish uh, rose. I didn't want to just do a, a, a realistic looking rose because most of them, as you can see, are symbols. And um, so I found this great rose that I you know, was looking at images and it had pattern and it was all symmetrical. Oh, this is perfect. So I did it and I painted the whole thing and I showed it to him. You think I would catch on? <laughs> Don't paint it until after he's seen your sketch. <laughs> but no. I show it to him and get, oh, Alice, yes, that's a beautiful rose. It's very pretty. Um, but that's the Tudor rose. And I went, what's that? <laughs> you know, he goes, well, King Henry VIII, when he left the church, he made his own rose symbol of his heresy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe we won't do that. I went to the drawing, <laughs> painted over it, made a new rose. <laughs> but so it was fun working with Father. He's, he's very knowledgeable, and we really had fun with the symbolism. I love symbols. I love that things mean things. Um, they took me about 12 months to go through uh, to, to paint them all, 28. Um, and I wanted to go through just a few to talk about the symbolism. I mentioned the, the blue in the background on all of them. So I'm going to pull up a couple of them. Now this one is Father's favorite, because this was the one uh, dedicated to Father. Uh, this is the Gate of Heaven, and I kind of wanted to go through some of the symbolism in this. Uh, so Mary is the Gate of Heaven. So Mary is, brings us through to Jesus. He, she's the direction. She is pointing the way through the, the gate or the portal to get to Jesus. So the strong pillars lighting it are Mary, to represent Mary. And then we have in the middle, we have Jesus. That is the Greek uh, monogram for Jesus. And around it are rays of light, because that is the light. That is where we want to go. She is directing us. And the carpet that's going towards Jesus is purple, because to truly come to Jesus, to truly go to heaven, we must repent. And, co and the color purple is a sign of um, humility, of repentance. So to be able to be with him, she is going to guide us there. But we also need to become humble of heart. I love the symbolism in this one. So most of them... Whenever it's a queen, you'll see a crown. And so pretty much half of them have crowns. And I had to come up with, each crown is different. I came up with new creative ways to make a crown. 
Most of them have the fleur de lis, and I don't know if you know what the fleur de lis is the lily. And because Mary is our pure lily, and so often the fleur de lis is to represent and to honor her purity. Um, so I did lots of fleur de lis. The red stones, this is a good uh, example of numbers. Almost all of them have some sort of numbers that mean something. So this is three. Does anybody know what three in the Bible represents? <laughs> the Trinity, right. There are a lot of fives, you'll see a lot of sevens, you'll see a lot of twelves, and you'll see a lot of threes on there. And I'll go through some of them and you'll see, because they all mean something. No nothing was put on here whimsically because I wanted to. Usually they all kind of meant something. So this is the Queen of the Apostles. So we got a queen, so she's got a crown. And the funny thing in the middle is actually an M, which represents Mary. But it also is the cross because she is the mother of Jesus and who died on the cross for us. Um, going around it are 12 stars representing, she's queen of the apostles, representing the 12 apostles. Does anybody know why 11 of them are red and one is white? What's that? St. John. So all of the apostles, except for St. John, were martyred. So they're red to represent the martyrdom of them. St. John died of old age. But also the placement of the star being right there is meaningful too. Uh, at the Last at the Supper, he sat at the right hand of Jesus. He was there at the cross, right with him at the end when he um, died. So this it also represents, um, it's, it represents his position to um, Jesus and the, the loved one, the beloved. Okay, so then we have Queen of Saints. Again, she's a queen, and we have Fleur de Lis. Here I put, oh, I forgot. On the other crown, there were red, the three. The red represents the blood of Christ. So again, I have red. We have five up there. Does anybody know what the five represent? The five wounds of Christ. Down below, we have three representing the Trinity. And again, they're in red. Okay, I've got a, this is so beautiful. What the meaning of wheat. So the wheat, represents all saints. Um, the, the wheat is a growing uh, plant that's rooted in Mary. And this plant will become bread, which will feed us. The saints are here to feed us, to draw us closer, to nourish us so that we can draw strength and to follow Christ and to make it to heaven with the saints. We're all called to be saints. We're all called to be that wheat. But we can turn to the saints as our substance to, to strength. Um, there are seven here. And does anybody know what seven represents in the Bible? Creation, perfection. So I love this. This is, uh, was written in, I, not my words, um, this number seven in scripture indicates complete, completion and perfection. The lives of the saints help God complete his perfect plan of salvation. So that's meaningful to us that the saints are here for us, but also calling us to become these saints. Be rooted in Mary. Grow forth. Flourish uh, like wheat does. And to be bread for others as well as we turn to Jesus for the bread of life. Okay, so those are just some examples. Could you imagine if I went through all 28? It really would be a very long evening, though I would have a lot of fun because I love this stuff. I love that it, it all means something. I love symbols too. But I wanted to talk too. Oh, excuse me, could you mention, is that the notebook from the church? 
Yeah, I will. I'll, I'll get to that. Yeah. So, um, okay. I did want to talk a little bit of the spiritual journey that I went on while painting these. Um, first, I kind of need to set it up and tell you where I was at before I started. Um, I had two years before this um, project began, my father had just passed away and I was in a very deep state of mourning. A week after we buried him, I started a new job for the first time in 20 years. I um, went back to work, as my youngest was that now in school, and I taught art at the school for two years. I don't think it was my calling. Um, I was physically exhausted. I was mourning. I didn't know at the time, but I had a huge tumor starting to grow in my kidney. So my body was fighting cancer. I was exhausted. And I was also spiritually tired. Um, I hadn't been dealing with issues, and um, I, I just was in an exhausted, overwhelmed place in my life. And another thing is, I did not really understand a relationship with Mary. I got the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit and I, we worked together really well. I knew how to talk to the Holy Spirit. That I got. I got the Trinity. I got, there's so many things I understood. But the Mary thing, I, it was more of, okay, this is what I should do. Um, so I come into this and I thought, okay, I have this art project. I want to be like the monks. And that icon that he showed, that Father showed you, they were required before painting to fast and pray. It wasn't just making pretty pictures for us. They, it was a spiritual experience in hopes that it will become a spiritual experience for anyone who saw it. And I thought, you know, I was inspired by that. I'm going to pray while I do this. It took me, I would spend about four hours a day painting. And sometimes I would forget to get up. I would get so involved that four hours would go by and I was still sitting in the same spot. But I, during that time, I decided I would pray. Um, and I'm going to show you some of the slides that as I started to do this, and it was, it, it wasn't to be noble or anything. I just thought, this. I have four hours. I'm sitting here before I have to pick up the kids. I'm going to spend some time in prayer. And then I noticed that some of the images that I was drawing me to Mary, thinking about Mary, some of them reminded me of people, of other people. This image, the Immaculate Conception, is the... Um, your, um, oh, what's it called? Sorry. The miraculous medal. What? The miraculous medal. The miraculous medal. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Nervous uh, blank here. <laughs> Anyways, as I was doing this, I was sort of reflecting on a miracle that happened to my niece just a few years, a couple years before this. My niece, who was in college, was on spring break and had been um, hiking in the Alps and a huge avalanche came and knocked she and a friend, they were with a big group, but she and a friend got knocked off a cliff. Unfortunately, her friend did not survive. Amy got knocked off, fell two or three switchbacks, you know, when you switch back, and her little backpack, the little net pocket that holds your water bottle, caught on a spike that was sticking out. And she hung upside down from this spike and in her backpack. The helicopter, the, the Swiss um, Alps helicopter rescue, they had to get close enough to the mountain because there was no way by foot to get to her and to be able to grab her and put her into the helicopter. Amy um, was rushed to burn and they um, did brain surgery. She has a metal plate in her head. Amy, uh, it's a miracle she survived. As they were, uh, I guess, taking her to the hospital, they noticed that her miraculous medal that had been blessed by Pope John Paul II was just dangling on her, not attached, but was just there. 
And my brother and his family all credit this to Mary, that this miracle happened, and they have a great devotion to the miraculous medal. So as I was painting this, I reflected on that miracle. Um, Amy now um, is pregnant with her second baby and was able to go finish up college, got her master's in theology. She has an amazing story to tell. Uh, Mary was there for her, and they, we all know it. And, oops. Um, so as I was painting this, I started praying from Amy. I started praying for my brother and his family and um, for the many miracles that she, Mary has done through the Miraculous Medal. This is another one that as I started painting it, this is the Mirror of Justice. And what I love about this one is that the mirror in the middle does not reflect our image or even Mary's image it reflects, that's the Lamb of God. It reflects Jesus' image. So therefore, Mary is there not for her glory, but to reflect Jesus to us so that we see Jesus better through her. And as I was working on this, I thought of my father. My father who had recently passed was a lawyer. And my father's motto in life was do the right thing. That was it. It was very simple. You were to do the right thing. Uh, he believed in justice and fairness. Uh, so when I worked on this one, I began to pray for his soul. And that was a healing, bonding time with my father as I was painting. Okay, this is my favorite. Uh, queen of the family. And what's so beautiful about this is the roots. So the holy family... Jesus, Mary, and Joseph are at the roots of our lives. They are what will flourish us, feed us, and so that our family can grow. And I love the roots, and Father had recommended this, be messy and tangled and intertwining, because that's what family life is all about. It's not simple, things don't grow straight, it's all intertwined and messy. But when you have the Holy Family at the root, where your roots are, at the center of it, you are going to have bright green, flourishing growth. Um, so, of course, and it's gnarly, and nothing is smooth and gentle about this. I try to make it as chaotic but flourishing as possible because, I mean, you all know, families are chaos. <laughs> but if you have the Holy Family at the center, it will flourish and be full of green, beautiful growth. During this time, I prayed a lot for my family. Um, going, you know, working again, having six kids, going, some going off to college, some starting school. It was just a time where I felt very connected to my children, to my husband, to my extended family, to my, um, brothers and sisters and my mom and my dad in heaven and my 26 nieces and nephews. So it was a beautiful family bonding time through prayer. Um, so the growth that began, a lot of it helped me start to see Mary in a different way. A lot of it were the titles of Mary, thinking about them, the symbols of Mary, uh, and the time of prayer and seeing what her role was for us and for myself. Um, going into it, I told you, was a kind of uh, hard time. And coming out of it, I felt great peace. Um, I felt very close to Mary. I felt the Holy Spirit just so alive. It was a happy time. It was one of those mountain times. When I did these, it was a happy time. Um, and I got to share, this is... My final one, this was the second to last one I did. And I've got to share it with you because most of these would take about a week to do. The checkerboards itself would take about <laughs> two or three days to do. But they, <laughs> they took away the vein of my existence. Um, but this one was awesome in that I sat down and started painting. I did all this. And I looked at my clock, it was one hour. It was one of those things that I just was on fire. 
it was and it was done and the whole time I felt in a different place and I knew it was the Holy Spirit and I thought what a great way to wrap this up there was no anxieties that it just flowed it worked and I just so thankful and happy when I finished this and I told father I said this is it this is it he said yeah that's it you know there's nothing to change on that one <laughs> it worked so anyway so I shared with you my personal experience and I would love to go through each one, but as I said, it would be a very long evening. Um, but I do want to now turn it over to you. How can the rondelles, or any sacred art in the church, or in any church, help you spiritually? And the first thing I wanted to say, um, I wanted to point out, in the back of the church, there should be, it's not there right now, but there should be, and it will be soon. It was taken out because of COVID. Um, there is a notebook like this, and in it are all the rondelles and a brief description of what everything means. That's another fun one. I could tell you all about that one, too. And then Father's, one, the one he just showed, the, um, the Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> Anyways, uh, pick it up. When you can, and hopefully we'll be back. Actually, it can be on there now. Um, okay. So we can go ahead and put them back out. And, and I think there are two. Don't we keep two? I, I think, think there are two. two. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and, and this is, is mine. It is online, too, if you, yeah. if you actually Google Yeah, if you go to the bottom there. Yeah. It's hard to find, though. You need to notice the But if you, if you actually Google St. Mary's Rondells, uh, okay. it will okay. take you to it. But take them, read them, find out what each of the symbolism, what, uh, ever, what it all meant. And then... Think about it, ponder it. Another thing would be, um, if you see a rondelle, it reminds you of someone, just like when that one reminded me of my niece, or the, my father, or my family. If you see one that reminds you of somebody, or something that somebody's going through, or even yourself, stop, pray. Pray for that person, or pray for yourself. Just take a, a minute to be inspired to prayer. And then the last idea I have for you is if you have a favorite one, when you go to Mass, sit under it and just feel Mary looking down on you. Be there with her, uh, engulfed in her love. So just kind of be there physically with her and, and pray. So that is kind of my experience, some of the rondelles I went through. Um, before we take a little break, and I will go on to the candles, the Paschal candles, I wondered if you guys had any questions. Any questions about any of the rondelles in specifically? Just yes. In general, I'll say, I'll go ahead. What's your favorite? Oh, I told you the, the, um, the family one. The yeah, that's, that's probably my favorite. It, it, both emotionally, and it was a lot of fun <laughs> painting that one too. Yeah. <laughs> I assume Father decided to have a location on each one. Oh, actually, I, I can say a little something to that. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so the location actually is. Uh, so, see it on. so the location actually is very important as well. Most of them have been uh, that are near the stained glass windows are paired with the window in some way. For instance, um, presentation of the temple. If you look near the presentation of the temple, can you imagine which one you'll see? It's the Immaculate Heart with the sword that's going through the heart, because that's what Simeon said to Mary, right? And if you look across from that, you have the, um, of course, you have the uh, uh, crucifixion scene. Guess what one is near there? Mother of Sorrows. Mm -hmm. So these things, you know, uh, have been you know, intentionally uh, put where they are, so you can kind of do a double prayer there as well. It's true. And the, the, up by the altar, we have the... Right. Um, Mother of the Eucharist, Queen of the Eucharist. <laughs> so yeah, Gabriel and, and Mother and Queen Mother. Mother, mother yes, yeah. Mother of the Eucharist and the um, Gate of Heaven, um, at, at right at the altar. So those are for specific um, meanings as well. Is there anyone that you've seen that you kind of were wondering about that I could, uh, you know, tell you a little bit about? Or you can just wait and get your own little, read your book. <laughs> yes, Karen. The, the angels that are part of the tabernacle. Oh, yes. So, those are so Queen of Angels, um, 
we use the angels that are, uh, when you see that tabernacle open, there are two angels there, and I try to duplicate. It was a little different because their positioning was a little different because it had a fit in a round thing, a round, an M. There's a lot of M's. Most of them have either a crown or there's an M in it somehow um, to honor Mary. Lots of crosses, lots of floor to leave. But that one, yeah. So if you, yeah. you see that one. Um, but the only faces. What's that? The only faces of those angels in all of yours. Yes, I, we decided we did not want to do people. We didn't want to do Mary as a person. Um, and I thought that was a great idea. It was more symbols of her. And that's when we did Our Lady of Guadalupe. That was a challenge, because how do you do Our Lady of Guadalupe without Mary? So we took different symbols of it that you would recognize. The moon, the, the flowers, the um, shawl. You know, we, so Mary's not there, but it's all the symbols of Our Lady of Guadalupe, the colors of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And you got your moon. Got the moon. I got my moon. <laughs> Different moon, but, <laughs> but there is a moon. Well, I don't know if he. That's if, why the deacons have to remember to really open that out. Yes, they do. <laughs> yes. I really did that in life. Any other questions? Do you guys want to take a little break to use the restroom or to visit or anything, and then we'll um, come back, or we could just plow through. What do you plow through? Okay. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is the indoor artwork I've done for the last well since tw 2014, I think was our first, right? 2015. Well, the one right before that was... So it was our first Easter yes. in the church. Father had come to me. He had seen somewhere overseas, I think it's Scotland or something? It was in England. England. Yeah. A candle that had been painted. And he came to me and said, can you do that? And of course, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, yeah, you could do it. You could do it. That's usually how it is. Yeah, yeah, you could do it. <laughs> And he said, here, here are two candles. They were, they were, you know, ultra candles. Take those, play around, figure it out. So I, I remember I Googled, how do you paint on candles? And at that time, I could find only two YouTube instructions, and they both were in foreign languages. <laughs> and so I was like, well, I have no idea what so I'm doing. have you made YouTube for other people now? I, I did notice that there are other people doing now, it. have you done that? Oh people. no, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I avoid the camera as much as possible. <laughs> um, anyway, so I did go home and I practice on them. Uh, the funniest thing I had to learn was that when you're painting a candle, it will roll on you. <laughs> and all your paint gets smudged. So I, I finally rigged up a little uh, seats for it to to sit in, and I still use them today. They're from the first one, the styrofoam I got, but they're very loud, and Darren now works at home, and he hears this, <laughs> so I'm constantly rolling it around to do it. So it began every Lent, I um, take on the task. There was one year, I was, it was right after. You, you were doing the peacocks. I was doing the peacocks at the time, and I just said, I can't, I just can't take this on right now. Um, but I wanted to show what exactly the Paschal candle is and the meaning. And it's, um, as it says here, during the Easter season, the beginning, um, be beginning at the Easter vigil, the candle is lit to remind us that through Christ's resurrection, he overcame the darkness of the tomb. The Paschal candle, which is lit during Easter season and at baptism, is a symbol of Christ rising from the dead and that he is the light of the world. So every church has their Paschal candle. Um, ours right now, since it's not Easter season, is over by the baptismal, the empty baptismal font. Um, but during the East, after the Easter vigil, it is brought forward and it will be there for the 50 days. Right, 50 days <laughs> um, until Pentecost. Um, so I wanted to, I have, fortunately, Mary Ellen, I got, I got. 
kept one of them, so I can have one to show you. This was the second one that I did. Uh, usually, uh, we'll say something up here. I don't think so. This year it doesn't say something there. No, no. <laughs> so wait a minute. It was a special year. But this year is a special year. I'll tell you about this year's later. Usually here it is Christ. Um, usually it is the Cairo or it is the H IHS, which is the monogram in Greek of uh, I'm trying to, my instructions. Can I hold it? No, no, no. I'm just trying to think because this one's different than the one I went from. Um, as we go down, oh, I see. This year it says on it, I don't, I'm going to butcher it. It's Latin. Resurrect Secut. Resurrect Secut. Yep, that's it. <laughs> he is risen, he said. In Latin. That's what it will say this year. Then I, I have the IHS or I've done um, the Cairo. As we go down, can everybody see it? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, that's great. Okay. Okay. Anyway, maybe Darren can be Vanna White and walk around with it after I tell it. Uh, then we have the Alpha and Omega from the beginning to the end. Um, in Greek, we'll have the cross. Every year we have the cross in the middle, and we'll have the date. Could the date of the Easter. The day to the people at home. Can I? Yeah. That's just. Is that good? And then just the other one. Okay. Okay. And then the, below that, I always do some sort of image. Yeah. Um, this is the since it was the year of mercy. Um, we did the Sacred Heart of Jesus with the water blood. and the blood coming out, and then it says in Spanish the year of of mercy. So usually, you can walk around with it if they want to see. Y'all can touch it. It's interesting to touch. <laughs> and it smells really good too. My my whole uh, studio right now smells like beeswax, and I love it. He Father gets really good ones, blank ones. Okay, so going down through this, we have the different, and then the most important part on at the Easter vigil, Father will put in five nails that have incense in them, and. The five nails are to represent the five nails or wounds into Jesus. I guess he had four nails and one thing. Yeah. Right. Um, so this 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 is the one that's there now, and this the picture on it is the sacrificial mother uh, pelican. And it is also in our altar somewhere. It's on the tabernacle door. Okay. And what it is, um, giving the blood to the children to feed the children. is a, It's an old, I think, early Christian symbol of um, Jesus' uh, sacrifice. And Louisiana actually put it on their state flag because they were so Catholic. Oh. Um, so over the years... I've done, the first one was the Lamb of God, then it was the Your Mercy, which is that one. I did peacocks, which you see right there, which is a symbol, early Christian symbol of the resurrection, and we'll go into that more when we talk about the peacocks on the Birds of Paradise mosaic. The angels didn't like that one. I told Father, he goes, what do you want? Do you want this? When he was done with it. And I said, no, you can burn that one. He goes, isn't that what you're supposed to do with the candle? <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, and then the pelican. And then this year is the year of St. Joseph. So I've had a lot of fun with this one um, coming up with symbols for St. Joseph and uh, colors and, and things for, for him. Um, briefly, my... Spiritual. Sorry. Um, the spiritual growth that's going on. This, this is kind of my Lenten thing. It's my Lenten offering. I kind of. This is uh, my gift to the church during Lent. Just put it over. I think it will, it will stand better. 
Um, which it always comes, you know when you decide to do a sacrifice, it's always harder than you thought when you said, I'll do this sacrifice. And it always seems that during Lent is a crazy time at the house and with the kids and things going on. And it's been so good to get me grounded and to uh, focus on Christ. Um, so for me, making this candle has been a beautiful part of my Lenten journey. It's just taking that break and that time. They usually take me about a week to do. Um, often I pray for the church as I'm uh, painting the candle. This year, especially since it's the year of St. Joseph, I've been centering a lot of my prayers on the men of our church, the St. Joseph's of our church, and that, um, and for my St. Joseph and growth in, within the church. Um, this is a beautiful prayer that Father says at, or I guess you don't say it, do you? Which, yeah. which prayer? The, the, um, the oh. exultant oh. prayer. Oh, oh, okay. Because so you want to it. sing it? <laughs> oh. <laughs> but during the Easter vigil, this prayer is said for the candle as it's being presented. Sung. I'm sorry, this is sung. But I am going to read it. I'm not going to sing it. Because it's Lent. Uh, <laughs> on this... Your night of grace, O Holy Father, accept this candle, a solemn offering, the work of bees and of your servants' hands, an evening sacrifice of praise, this gift from your, holy, your most holy church. But now we know the praises of this pillar, which glowing fire ignites for God's honor, a fire into many flames divided, yet never dimmed, by sharing of its light, for it is fed by melting wax, drawn out by mother bees, to build a torch so precious. So as this prayer is being said, it always brings a tear to my eyes because it reminds me that this work I've done isn't about me, it isn't about my artwork, it's a, a gift to the church, it's a gift to God. And um, so that, I love that prayer. So my advice or encouragement of how this Paschal candle can help you spiritually grow, that I think as it's especially up at the altar, or even in the back of the church near the, the font as you come in, when you see it, think of the symbols. Think of everything on it is saying, Christ died for you. He is alive. He is he's resurrected. Um, and it's, it's said in many languages. <laughs> so often we've got Spanish, English, Greek, Latin. And the, the point is that Jesus is our Savior. So as you see it, ponder on that. And then say a prayer for yourself or others. And as you pray, like most of the candles, they are to be lifting up and watch the smoke. Think of your prayers going up to heaven. Just try to visualize the whole experience. It's not just saying, oh, that's a candle. But say a prayer and, and just see your prayers going up with the smoke up to heaven to Jesus. And then think about your baptismal vows and how you can then go out and be a light just like that candle is a light. So, major question. That, Sorry, what yeah. kind of paint did you use? Oh, I do acrylic. I do acrylic, and then I do a because um, acrylic was the only thing that adhered to it. Wax is a hard thing to put things on. You know, watercolor, nope. <laughs> you know. Um, did you and, have to treat it first? Did you have to treat it first? No, I paint it, and Maybe then when I'm it. done, I I treat it. So I did try. Mm -hmm. I did try like scuffing it and sanding it, it did nothing yeah. to it. But I just paint on it with acrylic, and then when I was, I'm was i done, I do a matte finish on it of a sealer. And that, I had to make sure that it wasn't flammable. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a lot of figuring this out as I went along, since I had never met anyone or seen a candle painted before, so this was all kind of figuring it out as I go along. And now you can teach the class. No, I'll teach the class. <laughs>
But anyways, I enjoy being able to do this for the church and for you all. I enjoy, it to me, bring, brings me such uh, purpose and energy to be able to create things, um, especially the candles, the rondelles, the other. So I get a kick out of it. So thank you all for letting me. And thank you, Father, for asking me over and over, hey, have you tried this? <laughs> no, but hey, let's give it a try. Oh, you could do it. You could do it. <laughs> so I appreciate it. Well, thank you. Did it so next week, uh, next Monday, I'm going to talk about my, a new thing that I had never really done ever before was mosaics. And I'll show you, I did a tiny little thing once for Father, and it was like, oh, you could do a, you could do an 8, 10 foot, 20 foot, yeah, sure, you could do it. <laughs> and I did it so you're right, <laughs> but I didn't know what I was doing. But, and so it was a, the journey of the mosaics, and I'll start next week talking about Our Lady of Guadalupe, um, which is out there. So anybody have any questions? I just wanted to also mention that there's also an earlier year candle in Old St. Mary's. Yes. That they can look at once Old St. Mary's is at the beginning. <laughs> well, that's what we often do is we'll yeah. take the retired one and scratch off <laughs> the date and paint on a new date and then use that in the Old St. Mary's because a lot of baptisms are yeah. in a smaller church are done. Also, a while the Spanish right? Yes, right. yes. But it's, so it, you you can see two years worth of it, except for I think the one in the old church now is the year I said nope. So <laughs> <laughs> that's not mine. That was a store bought one. <laughs> well, that was for a good reason. You were, you were doing right. That. I was I was very busy. You were employed on So Father, would you mind saying a little bit about the Easter candle with the Easter vigil? The green Easter vigil. Yeah. Too? They might want to come. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. You should come. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh. Yes. Like a little pitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 They'll get to see the new candle. I thought you wanted me to like preach on the Easter candle no, 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 during no. the Easter vigil. <laughs> so, um, so if how many people that are here have been to the Easter vigil? Okay, pretty much everybody. And you know, I know it's long, but uh, but it's supposed to be. Right? That's the point. It's a vigil. Right? You're keeping vigil. It's, you're supposed to feel like you're waiting. So, uh, probably one of the main uh, actors, if you will, of the Easter vigil is this Paschal candle. The word Paschal means Passover. It's, you know, Christ is our Passover, as St. Paul said. The, the Christ candle. And, uh, and it, it takes center stage, really, because it, is, it becomes uh, one of the primary symbols of Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Uh, so we've actually we started outside and we bless the fire, right? Uh, the actual new light, the new fire is blessed and it's lit from that. And then the deacon carries the, the flame into the church. And then when we get to, and we're singing Christ our light as we go along, we get to the middle of the church, that's when we all begin lighting our candles from it. And so what she had up there, that prayer, it said, you know, a light divided but not dimmed, right? Because you take a light from it, but it didn't take light away from Christ. Your light actually only made things brighter, right? When you, be, when you took light from Christ. And, and truly, the, all the lights in the church are out, and it actually is this beautiful, bright, warm glow. And then the deacon sings for us. Uh, what you, part of what you saw, it's a little longer than what you just saw. Um, so, and then uh, after that, you know, the, the candle's there. But then the candle then leads the procession back to the baptismal font, and for the new baptisms, and the newly baptized light their candles from that. And then it brings us back, you know, to the front, and that's where it stays for uh, for the fifty days. So, any questions? <laughs> All right. So, you want to finish it out? <laughs> um, well, no, that that's it. Um, if we could close some prayer, that would be sure. wonderful. If you want to well, leave it. Send the come here. Sure. <laughs> In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Thank you all for coming.